Welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast channel for sustainable procurement. We hope you like what you hear. Please go to www.iso2400.org for more information, learning resources, tools and much more. Hi, I'm Sean McCarthy, Director of Action Sustainability. Welcome to Podcast 4 in a series of five podcasts around human rights and supply chains. I'm delighted to introduce Elise Grill and Helen Carter. Would you like to introduce yourselves, please? I'm um, a human rights lawyer. I started my career as a public defender, so my specialty was criminal law and, and really a public defender in, uh, in criminal law for many years. I was also involved in the creation of the International Criminal Court, so I became a specialist in international criminal law. But now I work more as a human rights lawyer for the last 10 years, and especially in business and human rights, which is a new field of practice, which is now officially recognized uh, in the legal classification by chambers and partners and other big law firms. So it is a real field of practice, which kind of marries different fields of law. We can get back to that. And I'm also an international mediator. I'm a member of Nine Bedford Row in London. So I think that's a connection to the UK that's worthy of mention. And I am a lawyer licensed in France, in Canada, and also I'm a legal consultant with the New York Bar. Thanks, Elise. So, Helen, would you like to follow that? I don't think I can, to be brutally honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can. You're doing yourself down. <laughs> but, in, but in terms of my experience, I'm obviously part of Action Sustainability. I've known Sean for a very long time because I've been with him virtually from the beginning on this one. I am actually procurement by background. I've sort of spent three decades working in procurement and supply chains. So that's the angle that I come to this from, from my perspective. I've been involved in sustainable procurement for about 20 years, but probably the last 10 ever since I picked up a piece of work for something called the Supply Chain Sustainability School, which some of you may be familiar with. I looked at modern slavery um, as part of that initially, very much in those early days started to see it as this is something that's bubbling away and coming, uh, needless to say why we're here today. Over those 10 years, I've been responsible for developing um, the school's approach to how we help with the construction industry. I've worked alongside businesses to understand how they look at particularly supply chain due diligence and, and best practice within this space. And this year was the launch of the British Standard BS 25700, which is part of a standard, a free standard actually, that BSI have created to help organisations understand what they need to do to deal with modern slavery. I was part of the authoring committee and wrote the particularly the procurement element of it. And I have the privilege of being the new head of the shadow committee for the UK for the new ISO standard that's going to be looked at over the next few years. So taking the British standard and taking that on. So whereas Elise is the legal framework, I have less of that, but much more around that sort of supply chain due diligence and, and engagement space. Can I ask you both for a view on just transition? That's one of the things that we put in the, the agenda and we've we kind of yeah. touched on it so far. But if maybe I can start with, with you, Helen, we're hearing this expression just transition now quite yeah. a lot. I think a lot of people don't either don't know what it means or there are different interpretations. But what does it mean to you? I liken this, it's an evolving subject matter. I mean, the first mention of it, I suppose, was the Paris Climate Agreement. And, and I, I liken that to a bit of a lazy interpretation because basically they realised that they needed something to hang on to climate sort of progress so I thought jobs everyone likes a job everyone wants that so let, let's get let's make it green jobs and that was sort of the way it, it, it started really good report to read is the OECD definition in 2017 which actually sort of really expanded that and said no 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 obviously from a climate perspective it is this balance and Elisa alluded to it earlier on it is this balance of you know we have planetary limits but it is not about trampling on the people to get to be able to deal with these issues people are one of the stakeholders and in the OECD document when it was talking about just transition it talked about workers rights it talked about society rights it talks about the role of government and the role of cities and communities in able to to do this but what i've seen over the years i've been dealing with this and looking into it is people have tended to latch on to the really easy bits to a certain extent so okay how am i going to how am i going to deal with fuel fuel poverty i can bring this into my business strategy and make it a real plus for us in how we engage with you know people that have got energy energy problems uh, fuel poverty problems oh the, the jobs is 
is easy because we can use it as a way to upskill and we can tie it into into that. Hence why I tend to link it to social value, which is not quite as uh, it's not quite that simple. But I'm still yet to see people who are really thinking about worker rights and human rights in supply chain. That's I mean, businesses where I've seen just transition strategies. It talks about all of the stuff around the government lobbying, around the uh, around the community, around poverty, around and they won't declare what they're doing around transparency and supply chain. And, and the issues if we think about solar panels with the Uyghurs. And it's not just actually China and the Uyghurs. They're in Malaysia. They're in, you know, you've got copper and aluminium and silver. So you've got lots of other regions that that, that need to be considered. Um, I'm not going to talk about the lithium in the batteries, or I am, but no one's going to worry about it. I'm not going to talk about the cobalt that's in the mines, because again, a little bit difficult to do. Semiconductor. It's in pretty much anything that is a solution to climate change. And there's a lot of awareness and very little action other than can I comply with my supply chain so for me just transition is literally this sort of idea of you know i need a climate strategy but it has to take into consideration the people and the people has to has to cover everything it has to cover climate debt poverty workers rights community engagement government involvement and then a bit what at least was alluding to with mediation you'll get a situation where the solutions make sense they're not just what i lovingly call green bling my solution is to plant a tree or to to do a solar panel we can come up with some really constructive solutions to the climate change requirements because they're informed by people who are experiencing the issues and and i think that's eventually where it's getting to that's seems to be the conversation increasing over time. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, just transition is really that. I mean, it's it's making sure that the way you transit, how you transit, when you transit, and, and with what means and how it's transformative of society is fair, is, is being done with consultation. You can't say like tomorrow morning, there will be no more electricity because we cannot... Uh, afford it it's too it's too damaging to the environment you'll have a revolution on your hands people if you tell them okay maybe the planet will be cleaner in 30 years i might not be here in 30 years i want my job today i want to be able to live today with my children so people are not ready for that kind of immense trade off which the more we wait the more it might be necessary but i mean this is a societal endeavor at the at the level of the whole planet. And so everybody has to show solidarity and work together. And when you see, especially with the pandemic and the globalization, how social inequality has become just bigger and bigger and bigger, you say we're not getting it. We're just not getting it. How do you want to ask the poorer to make all the sacrifice? while the richer are getting richer. So it is a societal matter. The podcast I did that I think I shared with you, Sean, I called the um, Just Transition the human face of of climate change. It's all about the humans that are going to be living that. Of course, it includes biodiversity. Biodiversity is essential. This is the environment in which we live. But it has to be done fast, it, 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 in a way, it has to be done in a radical way, but it has to be done in a way where people can continue living. Maybe everybody will have to do sacrifice. So if everybody does sacrifice, they might be ready to do it. But you cannot impose the sacrifice always on the most vulnerable, the weaker, mm. and just get the super rich to, to be OK. And that applies to country as well as yeah. people. Because the poor countries are not the ones creating the pollution. It's big countries like the U.S. and China. And you're asking the small countries to make huge, not only small, because India is not small, but to make huge changes that are extremely costly. And you're not giving them the means to do it. I have a friend who's an environmentalist who told me if we took 0.1% of every financial transaction, we could create a pool of money that would permit everybody to transition. Mm -hmm. 0.1%, that's like 1% of one, I mean, it's one tenth, 100% of 1%. This is like, nothing this this should be the way to go i mean people but you need very dynamic politicians you need politicians that believe in all that it's a common action it needs to happen at all levels of society but again taking into account the people 
I think what's quite interesting as well is is this idea of remediation. So there's obviously lots of conversation around climate debt and how much countries should be paying each other in terms of compensation. But when you look at remediation, particularly in the human rights part, it's a basket of solutions. So we, we get very possessive, particularly in the West, about money and about, you know, profit and, and everything else. And whilst I think there's still a lot more probing and pushing to do in that space to sort of really get people to cough up a few pennies here or there, there's much more that can be done that goes goes beyond a purse, beyond paying out batches of money to various countries that could actually deal with, with the issue of how we upskill, how we invest, how we, you know... So, so I look at it now and we look at the whole, I think it's the EU critical minerals legislation that's coming in that's designed specifically understanding that actually the other big problem you're having with just transition is not just the human rights, but actually the ability for the West to access. Because over the next few years, we're, we well, literally over the last three months, four months, I've seen China thinking about rationing what they're going to be giving out in terms of critical minerals to support their own economy. I've seen Chile saying the same thing. They're sitting on an awful lot. I think it's lithium that they're sitting on that they're actually thinking yeah. of rationing out not letting people access to the minerals and the, the products that we um, that we are looking for it's like the new oil race this not the, the, the whole economic structure is now starting to move so from a business perspective you know organizations are going to have to start thinking about resilience to be able to deal with the fact that the solutions are going to get very expensive and start to think much more in a collaborative model and I think that happen that needs to happen in a country by country basis as well in terms of you know how do we support emerging economies that want to grow grow rather than just thinking it's about writing a blank check there's opportunities for collaboration there's opportunities for them to grow as an economy and for us to then obviously get a little bit more security of supply so we do need people to sort of get off the normal treadmill and think about operating slightly differently but a lot of what i've seen around the climate change it just seems to be a great big bun fight over who's more responsible than who and you know we just need something to help us and we're not going to pay you it's a bit like kindergarten watching some of them sometimes so i I think as we get closer hopefully they will get a bit more inventive about the ways that they're looking at doing things yeah, I totally agree with you. And uh, this uh, quest for metal, I mean, you, you can, there's a movie that was released, I think, by um, Arte, the French, Franco-German TV called Cobalt. Yes. And I commend it to you. I mean, it's, you, you should look at it. You should see how still today Cobalt that comes from the center of the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, is being harvested. I mean, it's it's a public scandal. We mm. need cobalt to make these phones. These phone companies are making such a huge profi- a profit. I cannot believe they cannot ensure that these workers and these children are living in decent conditions since they bring the the metal that we all need. I mean, it seems unbelievable that it's still happening to that there's large a, extent there's a there's a massive issue here and this is where it needs to get a bit more interconnected because again the work that i'm doing on solar panels at the moment we're looking about circularity and end of life as a way to be able to reduce that reliance and i think there is a slight shift now and it i don't think it's anything to do with human rights unfortunately i think it's more to do with scarcity and cost but we are starting to see that circularity of conversation i think as much as we laud the, the younger generation as being much more responsible in this space, there's still, unfortunately, an element of it being very diverse around people still wanting their apples, still wanting their best tech. And actually, the reality is that the consumption, I mean, this comes back to the very beginning in terms of exactly what sustainability is about, is much more responsible consumption. And the, the need and programming that we we instill in, in our kids and our families of, I have to have the best everything now. And we don't make things last we don't go and and, and it's a, an age-old problem that we've been dealing with for such a long time but now it, it's much more at the forefront because we get these abuses because people want to consume so consumer behavior fundamentally becomes a really important part where we do see a real problem though is where consumers don't see what's being provided because it's hidden in industries yeah. like construction like you know manufacturing if it's a brand there's a real puller. If there's no brand, that almost gives us a shield to some of these companies because there's nothing to really look at. So it's a huge challenge. On a positive note or optimistic note, apparently lithium is highly recyclable or these batteries yes. are highly recyclable. So that will be yep. a new industry is the recycling of all these different components, these different equipments, these, this technology. I do yeah. believe I'm I'm a strong believer in the creativity of yeah, the human mind and the, the human spirit. And I, I believe that 
the technology might already be where we want it to be. But the, the problem is the politicians who are not keeping up and who are, have a vested interest often yes. not to keep up. When I look at these extreme right wing politicians in the U.S. who are still climate deniers, when climate events are happening in their states in the U.S. and if they didn't have the blue states to get them out of trouble each time, they would be sinking or burning so it's um, it's absolutely damning to um, to see how people are not um, fighting for their own interest in the longer term. They only look at very short term. That's another issue: yeah. short term versus long term. Yeah, definitely. And uh, the corporations are usually focused on the very short term return and short term uh, action. And I, and I think sort of the final point for me. I, 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 I am usually glass half full rather than glass half empty, I like to think. But the reality, I think, as well, is that what we're starting to look at is the innovation. But that innovation comes from people understanding the implications of what they're procuring and what they're buying. So understanding that if I have this, this is a problem with lithium, this is a problem, and actually challenging industry to do something with it. And I think if we can get people to have much more of a conversation around the holistic procurement, i.e. it is a it's saving an issue climate here, but it has these footprints, then actually we will start to see. So I know with batteries, for example, people have gone back to school and produced salt batteries that, that could potentially work that have a massive benefit. Could we upscale that? Could we incentivize that? Could we develop that? That's the government responsibility to try and help build those industries. And that's where I'm a little less optimistic sometimes. But I think the innovation itself, if you put in there, these are the problems and you give that holistic picture, we will start to get much more rounded solutions to these things and i think you know that's what we obviously all try and do as much as we possibly can in our day jobs on on the note of optimism i mean i feel that being a human rights lawyer and the world that we live in you have to be at least partially a dreamer because sometimes (laughs) i agree you wonder (laughs) why you're doing that when everything seems to be going so poorly when when that war in in ukraine started i mean i thought jeez unbelievable that we're there today and when Trump was elected, it was like a massive, I mean, to me, it was a massive disaster. I knew what would be coming. The only thing I had not seen coming was the, the level of the cruelty. And the cruelty is like, basically, it's the principle. So, but I have seen so many activists in so many countries, like, keeping at it, fighting every day, every day, Mm -hmm. every day. And that's so remarkable that that brings back the optimism and the courage of of the activists uh, is unparalleled. And it's especially true in the black community in the U.S. I mean, it's to see how these people are really devoted to fighting every day. They don't have a choice because the unfairness is so huge. Yeah. But... um, I mean, this. I mean, we won't have the solution today, but I think it's important to have these conversation and to expand the group with whom we're having these conversation. And uh, circular economy is certainly something that's starting to be very popular, and and people realize they have to consume locally and produce locally. My worry is that we're going to be forgetting about these regions that we have pulled out of poverty, like Bangladesh with textile and and Pakistan and other countries, Cambodia and even Turkey, and that uh, we need to to think about that. We cannot just continue closing in on ourselves, saying, okay, we're okay in this territory, while forgetting all the others. It's it's yet another balancing act. Uh, Definitely, and I think what businesses need to be able to do is understand where they can work with supply chains to really improve conditions and ensure that people. So, Rana Plaza was a great example. You know, Primark in the UK is is lauded for lots of challenges. They're very cheap. There's a whole issue around disposable fashion. But if you look at what they did working with with the victims and their families, you know, it's a really good example of where a business goes. I'm not pulling because there's problems. I'm staying here and working. And in the main, that should be the first issue and not the last issue. So, if you can go in there and improve and enhance and and really 
bring some benefit by you being there, then you stay and you develop. If you cannot do that and that's out of your hands and there's a bigger geopolitical conversation going on, which we know there are, then it's the heightened due diligence that you need to be looking at. Can I stay there? And if so, how do I do it responsibly? You know, getting businesses to think about human rights due diligence is, is one thing. Explaining heightened due diligence to them in this idea of a responsible, you know, withdrawal from these organisations would be, you know, you need to employ a lot of people to help you do that. And and, and that's a that's still probably not enough case studies around to be able to show how organizations have really done that really well. But yeah, I mean, we we talk a lot. When I talk a lot to my clients, it's usually, you know, the first thing you do is it's continuous improvement. You work with, you don't just with tract and withdraw. Where that is not possible, then there will be a point you can walk away, but you still have to do that responsibly. I, I, I agree. I agree with that too. I mean, I think I gave a talk with Phil Bloomer. I'm sure you all know Phil Bloomer from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center on uh, climate change and human rights in London in October. I didn't know you then, uh, Sean or Helen. So if not, I would have invited you. But we were of the, of the same mind. We were talking to a public of investors, of bankers, of asset managers. We were talking to ourselves, saying who would have thought that that you and I would be talking to a public of of investors, but we were trying to convince them that they had huge leverage and they were not aware of the leverage they had, that they could use their leverage to make a real difference. And they they cannot just come into a project and not look at these issues, because if not, they become accomplice to to the abuse that that are taking place both on the planet and on, on people. But it's encouraging that I was invited in Hong Kong at the end of March to talk to investors about these issues. To me, that's it's a little encouragement to think that these issues are traveling in very different milieu now and that people want to know. The people in Hong Kong were extremely educated, very well informed. They had tons of questions. The events lasted like extra hours because of the questions, but I was very happy to be able to have that conversation with them. And um, I think, again, we need to be encouraged where we can, because if not, it's too discouraging. But uh, we need to be inclusive and inclusive in the sense of not forgetting the global south. I mean, I think yes, that's fundamental in in our effort to save our, our own little corner of a country. I, I believe this it needs absolutely global solutions. I mean, local yeah. solutions are not going to do the trick. You need no. to have both, but you need to have global solutions that are going to work with, with local areas. So Elise and Helen, thank you very much for giving your perspective on Just Transition and how you feel we all need to work together towards a zero carbon economy in a way that's fair to everybody. I do hope our listeners enjoyed that session. This is podcast four of five about human rights, sustainability and supply chains. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our podcast on Sense and Sustainability. Please listen out for more episodes. For more information, learning resources, tools and much more content on sustainable procurement, go to www.iso2400.org.